So in our last lecture on the SOLA model, we'll be going beyond the model to talk about productivity. This lecture will also be have useful material, even if you haven't uh, watched or followed completely the first three lectures on the SOLO model. You'll have to bear with me I, as I go through a little bit of math, but uh, if you do that, there'll still be plenty of material on productivity in this video to be of interest. Let's get going. To review briefly, what we've shown is that the SOLO model is consistent with the stylized facts of economic growth. Countries which have invested more, for example, they tend to have higher levels of GDP per capita. We've also shown, however, that the SOLA model is inconsistent with the quantitative facts. In particular, it's hard to explain large differences in GDP per capita based only on investment, depreciation, and population growth rates. To be more specific, it's hard to explain the differences which exist. You can explain fairly substantial differences, but not as large as the differences which actually exist. It's also hard to resolve the SOLA model with data on interest rates, wages, and capital and labor flows. So to go beyond the strict SOLA model, we're going to want to start talking about productivity. Now, a little bit of intellectual history is in order here. When SOLA wrote down his model, he was thinking about A as being ideas exogenous to the model which were available to anyone in the world. So he was thinking about A as representing Newton's laws, uh, pasteurization, Maxwell's equations, the Pythagorean theorem, and so forth. Ideas available to anyone. Because these ideas were available to anyone, you couldn't use A to explain differences in GDP per capita across countries. So to explain GDP per capita across countries, you had to look at uh, capital, uh, human capital, and education, labor, and so forth. But what we've seen, however, is that these factors are not enough to explain all of the differences in GDP per capita. So that's going to push us back to thinking about how A may differ across countries. We're not going to be thinking about A here so much as public goods as productivity. So what we want to do is just change our interpretation of A a little bit to think about how well, given the ideas that you have, how well do you combine your capital and labor to produce output? So capital and labor can be combined in less efficient and more efficient ways. And a lower A now means a lower productivity, a less efficient combination of capital and labor. So let's take a look at a little bit at the math. So we can uh, divide uh, L both in both sides uh, to get this in terms of output per worker. And we can now think about this as uh, output per worker is explained by two factors by productivity and the factors of production, which are simply the capital labor ratio and human capital. So we're going to think about this as output per worker is explained by productivity times the factors of production. Let's take a look. OK, now let's compare the productivity level in two different countries. We begin with our equation, which we just had from the last page. Now let's just put two countries, one on top of each other. We'll put uh, Zambia or Zimbabwe on the top, the US on the bottom. Here's our equations for the two countries. Okay. Now what we want to do is divide both sides of the equation by this material in order to isolate the productivity differences. We do that, we get this equation down here. Now how do we interpret this? Well, let's suppose that the output per worker in Zambia were half that in the United States. Okay. If the ratio of the factors of production were also half, so the top figure here, if this were a half, if the ratio of the factors of production were also a half, then this would be 1. This would say that the productivity levels in the United States and Zambia were the same. So in other words, if output per worker was a half, but you had half the human capital and you had half the physical capital, then you can explain all of that difference uh, without resorting to differences in productivity. On the other hand, suppose that Zambia had the same levels of human and physical capital as the United States, so that this number was 1. They still had, however, half the output per worker. That means that the productivity level in Zambia must be half that of the United States. Okay? So this is just a simple way of dividing differences in output per worker. 
in terms of those differences which can be explained by differences in the factors of production and any remaining difference which must be due to differences in productivity. Now let's look at what happens when you apply this exercise empirically to data from the world. So in this table we do some productivity accounting. And this table, by the way, is from David Wall's book, Economic Growth, which you've already mentioned as being a very good book. Okay, here's how you read the table. What this table tells us is that in Mexico, output per worker is 0.29 the level in the United States. So the United States is defined here arbitrarily as being equal to 1, and the level in Mexico then is equal to 0.29, about 30% of the level in the, in the United States. Now why? Why is output per worker in Mexico so low? Well, in part, it's because Mexico has lower physical capital per worker. They also have lower human capital per worker. Together, the factors of production explain about half of Mexico's level of GDP per capita. In other words, what this tells us is that if, if, Mexico had the same physical capital per worker as the United States, the same human capital per worker as the United States, its output per worker would still be about half the level in the U.S. So what explains, accounts for the remaining half? Well, the remaining half is accounted for by productivity. Okay. Together, it's productivity and the factors of production which explain why GDP per capita is 0.29 that of the United States. So not only does Mexico have less physical capital per worker and less human capital per worker, it combines its capital in less efficient ways. It uses its capital less productivity and with lower productivity. And that, it's both of these factors, both of these factors account for the differences in GDP per capita. And what you see over here is that differences in productivity across countries measured in this way are surprisingly large. So even Canada, which is relatively similar to the United States, has a productivity level 20% below that in the United States. Zambia has a productivity level which is only 15% that of the productivity level in the United States. So that means that Zambia is labeling under you know, two really big problems. It's got less physical capital, less human capital, and it combines the capital that it does have in a very inefficient way. Now, there's lots that could be said about this table. You know, how well are we actually measuring human capital per worker? How well are we measuring physical capital per worker? Remember, productivity here is what we can't explain. So productivity is what's left over. Maybe if we have mismeasurement, maybe the productivity level would be lower. Nevertheless, I think it's quite accurate to say that productivity levels differ tremendously across countries. And the reason I think this is true is that we have not simply macroeconomic evidence for this, but it's consistent with the microeconomic evidence that we have as well. Let's take a look. So here we're showing some data from William Lewis's book, The Power of Productivity, on uh, productivity levels in Japan compared to the United States. Uh, Lewis, by the way, was the head of a very large consulting group uh, at uh, McKinsey and Company, which did this study over many countries, many industries around the world. Now, compared to the U.S. productivity level of 100, what we see is that Japan did extremely well in steel, automotive parts, metalworking, cars, and consumer electronics. This makes sense. After all, we know that Japan exports a lot of these goods, which it suggests that they're able to produce more at lower costs. And that's exactly what the productivity uh, differences show, that Japan is able to produce more valuable output using less valuable inputs than in the United States. Well, what about the rest of Japan? What we also see in this graph is that these industries accounted for just a little bit over 10% of the employment in Japan. So these industries, although we think of them as representing Japan Inc., you know, these industries are actually pretty small relative to the whole Japanese economy. So what does the rest of the Japanese economy look like? Well, astoundingly, it looks like this. Take the retail sector. The retail sector is huge. About 50% of the entire Japanese economy and its 
productivity level is half that of the United States. Housing and construction, another huge industry. Productivity levels much lower than in the U.S. Food processing, about 30% productivity level compared to the United States. And notice that food processing has about as large an employment effect as steel, automotive parts, metalworking, and cars, and consumer electronics all combined, about the same size. So what accounts for these big differences in productivity? Well, looking at the retail sector, a short way of putting it is Japan doesn't have Walmart. Japan has millions of mom and pop shops. And the problem is, is that these mom and pop shops are really inefficient. They use a lot of labor and, relatively speaking, a lot of capital to not sell very much. As a result, productivity is really low. Now, why is this? Well, one reason is, is that for many, many years it was illegal to have a retail store in Japan which was larger than 1,000 square meters. This was finally gotten rid of in 2000 uh, under U.S. pressure, but through a combination of land use regulations, of subsidies, and of uh, uh, licenses and regulations at the local level, the retail sector has remained moribund. The retail sector has remained full of mom and pop shops. Now, mom and pop shops may sound nice, but if you don't have Walmart, then you also don't have Walmart putting pressure on all of its consumer manufacturers to increase productivity, to reduce costs, and reduce prices. So the retail sector has knock-on effects. When you have a poor retail sector, when you have an inefficient retail sector, you get an inefficient sector manufacturing consumer goods. So uh, this helps to explain why Japan has a lower GDP level per capita than in the United States. They've got the human capital, they've got the physical capital, but through a whole bunch of licenses and laws and regulations and restrictions, they're not using their physical and human capital up to its greatest potential. And if you think this is bad in Japan, which is a developed country, it gets 100 times worse in a less developed country. India, for example, has all of the similar restrictions to Japan on the retail sector. India also for many years restricted the size of manufacturing firms. It said you cannot grow. It made it illegal to have a large firm. Even to do simple things requires often many licenses and many uh, import fees and corruption to uh, get anything done in India. So uh, Nandel Nilakani, for example, he is the, uh, one of the founders of Infosys, one of, Japan, one of uh, India's successful firms. He pointed out that in 1982, uh, Infosys applied for permission to import a 150 megabyte hard drive into India. 150 megabyte, that was a big deal back then. The import license took so long to arrive that by the time the license was given, the manufacturer was no longer selling 150 megabyte drives. It was selling 300 megabyte drives at a lower price. Unfortunately, because the good had changed, Nilakani had to go back and apply for another license. Fortunately, he was able to get that one before technology improved, and he would have had to apply for yet another license again. So all of these restrictions on how you can combine capital and labor, this creation of monopolies, uh, feather bedding, the labor unions, okay, restrictions on whom you can hire and whom you can fire, all of these restrictions reduce the efficiency with which capital and labor are combined, reducing productivity, and that has a big effect on GDP per capita. Let's sum up. So let's sum up in terms of this diagram from Modern Principles, my textbook with Tyler. So the solo model pointed us to physical capital and human capital as the most immediate causes of GDP per capita. In the solo model, technical knowledge was assumed to be a public good, was assumed to be available to anyone, and it was basically also assumed that organization happened automatically. Now we've seen that is not the case. We've seen that although physical capital and human capital are important, that they alone cannot explain everything about GDP per capita. You also have to look to productivity. You also have to ask, why is it that in some places they take their physical capital and their human capital and they organize it better? They organize it so that the output produced is worth more, so that it has greater productivity. And to answer that, we've got to look to incentives. The incentive to organize capital, to be an entrepreneur, 
to bring physical and human capital together to be productive. In a lot of places, rules and regulations and licenses prevent that. In a lot of places also, we have to ask ourselves, even though physical capital and human capital, even when they explain in a sort of mechanical way GDP per capita, why is it that some countries have more physical capital and more human capital than other countries? And again, the model is kind of telling us, well, you got to look outside the model. It's pointing us towards incentives. What are the incentives to accumulate capital? What are the ins how does the banking system work? How well does the financial system work? Is the financial system regulated so that interest rates are you know, artificially held low so that the incentives to accumulate capital aren't very high? What are the incentives to accumulate human capital? If you get an education and you do well, can you earn the return from that human capital, or is it all going to be taxed away? If you bring the human and, and physical capital together and you organize it, uh, are you going to get rich, or are your riches going to be taxed away? So again, all of these things are going to depend upon incentives, and incentives are going to be depend upon institutions. Things like the rule of law, open and competitive markets, a honest government, a non-corrupt government, and so forth. So the SOLA model, it's a great way of organizing our thinking about economic growth. It points us directly to physical capital and to human capital. Indirectly, we've seen that the alone are not enough to explain, so we've got to start talking about organization and productivity. That brings us to thinking about incentives, and that brings us to thinking about institutions. And a lot of the rest of our video lectures are going to be talking about institutions and incentives. Thanks very much.